Good morning, everybody. We're live here from the bird house, and today we're giving an update about the, some of the different birds coming into the area. You guys have sent in a bunch of photos, and we'll talk about when you can expect some of our common backyard migrants to come into your yard, like orioles and hummingbirds. As always, we love to know who's on. You can always say hi in the comments. We'd love to know what kind of things you're seeing, so absolutely post your sightings in the comments. And if you have any questions, you can put those in there too. So let's get started. We've got kind of a lot to share with you today. Um, first is get ready for mason bees. So if you have a mason bee house out, or if you're thinking about getting mason bees, now would be the time to put the house out. Mason bees are small, rarely stinging, you know, non-stinging little bees that we have in the area. And they're called mason bees because they use uh, materials to kind of cover their uh, their habitats. So mason bee houses, you might see them around. Um, they are little houses that are full of these tunnels and the mason bee females will lay her eggs inside of these little tunnels. Inside, uh, inside those tunnels, that egg will hatch. The larva will uh, will eat a little packet of pollen and nectar that she has left, and then they will pupate and stay in there all summer. So they'll stay in there all summer, all fall, all winter, and then in the spring they emerge and they pollinate. So that is about to happen now. Usually it happens mid-April or so once the temperature has been 50 degrees um, or, or so for a few days in a row, they start to emerge. So I was looking at some of the photos I had um, in previous years of when my mason bees emerged, and it's always around mid-April. So probably next week at some point, if we have a nice sunny day, you'll start to see that activity of the mason bees coming out of your mason bee house. And of course, we have a whole bunch of different mason bee houses interested in attracting them to your backyard. You don't need to, to do anything special. You put the house up about five or six feet high if possible, uh, facing uh, somewhere where it faces sun is great. Facing uh, east or south is, is usually good for them. And you just set it out and they find it. It's, it's pretty neat. So um, mason bees, you might start seeing them out soon. And as soon as they do emerge, we'll absolutely let you know. But it's probably going to be next week or so. That's when it typically is. And here's a video from a mason bee house that I have in my backyard. And you can see all the little caps of where they had capped off all of the, the little... Um, tubes here that had their eggs and larvae in there, and then they just kind of chew their way out and they emerge. So that'll be happening soon. Another uh, thing that's going on right now is the, the mating rituals and the mating flight of the American woodcocks. So if you are doing any hiking, you uh, should keep your eyes not only up for birds, but down on the ground. The American woodcock tends to be a bird that it, it blends in very, very well. You can find them in the woods, you can find them in open fields, but because their coloration is, uh, is so camouflaged, they can be hard to see. But they are around right now, and they have this really cool um, mating flight and they have a a neat call too that sounds like paint um this is this is what they do with their mating flight so at dusk if you have american woodcock around um so there's places that to go that you can see them the the big field out in webster is one place that people go to see them um out by braddock's bay they, they've got the the woodcock out in, in owl woods and in, in that area they do this pretty crazy um, mating flight where they will start on the ground and then they'll do this spiral that gets ever larger up into the air and they go up about 300 feet in the air and then they do this zigzag pattern back down to the ground. So they do that over and over again. That's one way that they will attract a mate. And so here's a picture of an American woodcock there with its nest. They'll nest just right on the ground, uh, so nothing super fancy. And here is a video with its call. So they that call, it sounds like paint. So here is a video of that. You can hear it. So now is the time to 
listen for that in the evenings at dusk is when you're going to hear this. And there's all kinds of uh, funny videos you can find online of American woodcock. They, they, when they walk, they kind of strut a little bit. So uh, I thought I'd share this with you because it's a funny one. <laughs> So they're actually a type of shorebird, even though you'll find them in the in the woods and in open fields. They're actually a type of shorebird. So that's they've got that long bill, and uh, and then they're they're going to look more like a bird you'd find on the beach. But they're actually in the woods and in fields. So they're around right now. We had a customer a couple of weeks ago who actually had one just in her backyard underneath a pine tree. So it was probably getting some some little worms or something like that out of the soil. So you just never know. You might see one in your backyard, but you're most likely to see one in the woods or if you're by an open field, especially at dusk, listen for that little paint call. And I thought I would bring up again that it is uh, because we're starting breeding season and nesting season. Um, if you use eBird, make sure that you are logging your sightings to the breeding bird atlas. The, the New York is going through through its third breeding bird atlas. This is the second year of that. And um, what that means is if you see any kind of nesting behavior that a bird is having, you can report that to the breeding bird atlas. And that is important because it will kind of show what birds are nesting where and when, and it helps uh, to determine what their populations are and what areas might be uh, might be needed for conservation. So as far as the Breeding Bird Atlas goes, if you are an eBird user, you can uh, submit not only your sightings of the birds you're seeing, but if you see any kind of breeding bird behavior. And what is a breeding behavior? Um, so singing, if you have a bird singing that's that you've been hearing, that can be considered a, a breeding behavior because they're trying to attract a mate. If singing for a week or so or more. Um, that is a really strong breeding behavior. There's probably in the territory that they intend to nest. So that is a breeding bird behavior. These are some of the breeding codes here that the breeding bird atlas uses. If you see a pair, two different two birds in a suitable habitat, that can be considered a breeding behavior. Um, carrying nesting material. So that's a big one. And some of you guys have uh, sent in pictures of birds carrying nesting material. That can, is considered a breeding behavior because they're doing nest building. So um, there's all these different breeding codes that you can submit along with your sightings in eBird if you happen to use eBird. And how do you submit it to the Breeding Bird Atlas. So you can uh, go into your eBird app. So for any of you guys that use that, when uh, you pull up eBird, this is what it looks like. This is what your home screen looks like. There's that big green button that says start your new checklist. If you click this little settings button down here that's circled in red, it'll bring up all these different portals that you can use. So in diff different states might have breeding bird atlases going on, different areas of the, the world might have them going on. Um, so you can click on this portal. It, might, it will just default to just regular eBird. And if you click this, it'll bring up all these different portals you can use. And you click on New York Bird Atlas, and that's what allows you to put in those breeding codes. So if you just use, if you're using eBird, you can always submit your bird observations. But if you want to submit this breeding behavior, you do have to change your portal here from eBird to the New York Atlas. So just thought I would give you guys that kind of tip in case you are using eBird. It is important if you're able to, to submit your uh, the breeding bird behavior as well. So that's something neat that's going on now and will continue to go on for the next couple of years uh, for the, the Atlas. So speaking of breeding behavior, here's some photos that have been sent in. This was sent in last year around this time. This is a, a fine example of a bird carrying nesting material. So this is a picture of a morning dove sent in by Chris, and that's morning dove carrying nesting material. So this time of the year, if you see a bird with some kind of sticks or grasses or anything like that in their beak, they are doing some nest building. So pretty cool stuff. 
Um, this photo is just sent in uh, from Chris also this past week. She says, not sure if the chickadees are going to have success with this, but they've been clearing out a hole in this old stump the past few days now. So this is another sign of birds that are starting to nest doing this breeding behavior. Chickadees are cavity nesters, so you can get them to nest in houses. We've had a couple customers that have been getting them coming and going out of birdhouses. They will also nest in wren houses usually. So sometimes um, birds, birds in general don't like a house that swings around a lot. So you'll find that most of the time bird houses are stationary. You want to put them on a pole or you want to, uh, you know, attach them to something so they don't move around a lot. Chickadees don't necessarily mind when that moves around, just like a wren. So if you if you think of a wren house, they tend to hang and swing around a bit. Um, chickadees tend to nest in those as well. We've had um, several people who've had um, chickadees coming and going from, from wren houses over the past few years. So keep your eye out on your wren houses if you do have some in your backyard because chickadees are starting to show some of this behavior of coming and going. So they will nest in cavities like this old tree stump here or a birdhouse that you can put out for them. And so here's a picture of, I love this picture here. It's showing the chickadee bringing some, uh, something out of that cavity. So it's starting to clear out the nesting cavity. Chickadees will build a nest with a lot of moss. So if you open up your birdhouse and you see there's some moss in there, it's probably going to be from a chickadee. And then here's some more nesting behavior that is going on. If you are trying to attract bluebirds, now is the time to make sure your houses are out because the bluebirds are showing signs of beginning to nest, which is really exciting. They're one of the first songbirds we have in the area to start breeding. They breed pretty early. Uh, some other birds will nest way earlier in the season, like birds of prey, like Great horned owls, for example, they're sitting on nests right now. They've got nestlings out, uh, but songbirds tend to start nesting later in the season and bluebirds are one of the first. So you guys have been sending in photos of bluebirds with their nesting material. This was sent in by Bob. He says over the past week, there has been a lot of activity at the bluebird house. I finally had a chance to investigate on Saturday, April 2nd, a grass, et cetera, on the floor of the house. I started reading and found out the male brings bits of nesting material to encourage the female to choose the site and begin the nest building. Sunday morning, the female did a very flashy dance on top of the house, which I hoped meant she chose the house. Finally, this morning, she started bringing materials to the birdhouse, so we should have a nest very soon. Here are a few photos of the process. So yeah, this is typical with bluebirds. Usually the male will start the nest building, then he'll start singing, trying to attract uh, a mate, and the female will continue the nest building process. So she'll finish that off. So here's a male bluebird on top of the house here with some nesting material. And it says little bits found on the floor of the house. So it looks like the male started nest building. Didn't do all too much. There's just a few little scraps there. And then uh, the female started bringing in nesting material as well. So here's the female bringing in more nesting material. You can see her, she's, uh, uh, she's popping into the house there with a nice long strand of nesting material. And here she is doing her flashy dance. So uh, pretty neat breeding behavior there, showing them doing some, some mating behavior. There is the female doing her flashy dance while the male flies around her. So really cool photos sent in by Bob there. And here she is with some more nesting material. He says, hardworking mama. So she is building the nest. So I'm um, curious to see how this plays out. Hopefully they'll have some successful, uh, some successful young that come out of that nest building. So we will keep you posted. One question we've been getting a lot as the weather warms up is when are the Orioles coming? So the Orioles uh, tend, just like hummingbirds, they tend to come around the same time every year, even if we're having a, a mild uh, a mild spring, mild winter, um, which makes sense. People go, well, if, you know, so say we're having a really warm um, early spring. Um, oh, does that mean that the birds are going to be here sooner? It really doesn't. And it makes sense if you think about it. They're coming from all the way really far south. They're coming from uh, south, south and Central America. So they have a really long flight to take. So even if we are having a mild 
late winter and we have an early spring, it doesn't mean these migrants are going to come any time, any earlier because they still have a huge distance to travel. So they don't have any way to really expedite that process. So it does take quite a while. They're on their way here though. They are starting to move and they usually arrive that last week of April is when people start to see them. So um, the last week of April, you absolutely wanna make sure your feeders are out by then. First week of May, they really start to roll in, but absolutely you wanna make sure that your feeders are out that last week of April. Um, the earlier you put out your feeders, the better as they migrate in, they tend to keep coming to um, their food sources that they find. So you absolutely want to make sure that you've got your feeders out by then. And we'll, we'll keep reminding you of that as well. So now's a good time to make sure you know where your feeders are. They're nice and clean. Um, we have plenty of jelly. If you guys are familiar with attracting Orioles, you've probably used this birdberry jelly before. This is our, our best seller here. The Orioles love grape jelly. That's their favorite. They'll of course eat orange halves, like you can see in the picture here. They like that citrus, um, but grape jelly is their absolute favorite. And this birdberry jelly is a mix of grape and blackberry and they just love it. So we have plenty of this in stock if you want to um, attract your Orioles and there's no, you wanna make sure you stay away from anything that has corn syrup or any kind of preservatives in it. So this has no preservatives, no corn sweetener in it. So this is made specifically for the birds and they, Love it. So Orioles, last week of April, absolutely want to have your feeders out. And then hummingbirds are usually a week after. So they start to roll in around that first week of May. And then usually around that second week of May, around Mother's Day, they are coming in in big numbers. So we still have a little bit of time before the hummingbirds and Orioles arrive, but they'll be here soon. So it's always a really exciting time of the year when they start to come into people's backyards. So some migrants that are coming into the area that you can see now, and you might see them underneath your feeders. Of course, the red-winged blackbirds, I can hear them. If you hear something, we've had a couple of customers go, I think I heard an Oriole. It could, it's probably not an Oriole. It's probably a red-winged blackbird. Um, Orioles are in the blackbird family. So sometimes they can sound the same, especially when the red-winged blackbirds, they have this high-pitched whistle. And if they are doing that, they can sound like an Oriole sometimes. So you might have a red-winged blackbird that's trying to disguise itself as an Oriole. Birds. Keep in mind, mockingbirds will mimic other birds as well. So if you think you're hearing a, an Oriole, it's probably not. It's a little too early for them right now. Um, so it could be a red-winged blackbird, could be a mockingbird trying to, trying to fool you. And red-winged blackbirds, of course, you can find them by uh, wetlands. They love, uh, that's their, their habitat. That's where they love to nest. But they'll also come to bird feeders this time of the year, especially as they're migrating in, they're hungry, and they tend to come to feeders more often in the spring than they do throughout the summer. So here's the female red-winged blackbird on the left. She looks quite a bit different than the male. So if you see something that looks like an overgrown sparrow with a lot of stripes on it and kind of a big bill, it's probably a female red-winged blackbird. And they tend to have this kind of orangish, yellowish wash on their face, the females do. So that's your female red-winged blackbird. And then of course, the male is black with that red and um, yellow patch. Sometimes they have more yellow than red, but um, that can vary also. So red-winged blackbirds, of course. Other blackbirds are coming into the area, grackles. We get lots of questions about grackles, how to keep them away from the feeders. Can be difficult to do, but putting out safflower seed can help. Grackles don't really like the safflower seed. So if you put just that out, they tend not to eat it. So safflower is one good way to attract birds like cardinals and purple finches and house finches, but the grackles and blackbirds and starlings even don't really like it. So that's one thing you can do. And cowbirds. So cowbirds, sometimes these three blackbird species, they'll form mixed flocks. So you might see red-winged blackbirds, grackles, and brown-headed cowbirds all together. That's not an uncommon thing. So this is a brown-headed cowbird, another type of blackbird that we have in the area. So some other birds to be on the lookout for are brown creeper. A lot of people have been reporting brown creeper. And this isn't a bird you're gonna see coming to your bird feeders, but you might get them in your backyard. I've, I've even gotten them in my backyard 
in the middle of the city. So you never know, you just might see them. If you've got any kind of trees, like large trees in your yard, keep an eye out for brown creeper. They blend in really well. This is our photo sent in by Bob last year of his brown creeper. Um, and you can see, this is the brown creeper right here on the left. You can see my mouse kind of circling it. They blend in really, really well, but they creep up a tree. So if you think of nut hatches, how they tend to crawl down a tree, brown creeper do the opposite. So they'll creep up the tree and then they kind of get up high. Then they'll fly down to the base and do the same thing. So they're creeping up the tree, looking for little um, food and insects and things like that, that could be wedged into the tree. So lots of people are reporting brown, brown creeper. Keep an eye out on your trees in your backyard. If you see something that's moving up the tree, it's probably a brown creeper. So pretty cool bird. They're, they're small. They're probably about, I would say, like chickadee size, uh, brown with that bill that curves down. So that is the brown creeper. Keep an eye out for those. And as far as birds you guys have spotted, this was sent in a couple weeks ago by Bob. He says, this little fella showed up today. I believe it is a field sparrow. Originally, I thought it was an American tree sparrow, but no spot on the chest and no two-tone bill. So yes, this is a field sparrow. Now is a time where you might find other types of sparrows underneath your feeders. I've been getting a song sparrow in my backyard. Never had those before. Um, so I've got one of those. We'll see pictures of those coming up. You might see white-throated sparrow if you've got a sparrow with a white patch on its throat right now underneath your feeders. You might get them. You might get white-crowned sparrows. So if you see something that's sparrow-like but it's not your typical house sparrow, take a closer look because you never know what you might see. And Bob had this field sparrow underneath his feeders. It looks like it looks like it's eating some seed off the ground. So really cool sighting. Here's the field sparrow with a junko that's hanging out there. So you never know what you're going to see this time of year, which is really exciting. Speaking of interesting things underneath the feeders, this photo sent in by Karen, who had a ring-necked pheasant underneath her feeder. Who'd have thought? You never know what you might see. So every once in a while, we hear about somebody seeing a pheasant, but they're not as common as they used to be. So this is a really cool sighting um, by Karen, who sent this in. Sometimes we hear of people that get turkeys underneath their feeders, but very rarely do we hear of a pheasant. So really neat photo sent in by Karen here of a ring-necked pheasant. And here is another type of sparrow. So this is a song sparrow. And this was sent in by Mark who found it at lock 32. And song sparrows are starting to sing right now. If you're hearing bird calls and you don't know what it is, absolutely Merlin app. I talk about that all the time, but it's such a good app. Um, the Merlin app will help you ID not only photos. So say you take a photo of a bird and you don't know what it is. You can upload that to your Merlin app. If you hit start bird ID, um, you can do photo ID and you can also click something that says sound ID. The app will listen to the birds that it hears calling and it'll tell you what they are. So song sparrows are very vocal right now. Cardinals are super vocal, the chickadees, the blue jays, they're all squawking and making sounds. Uh, like, so, like their name suggests, song sparrows sing a lot. So they tend to perch you know, up, up on a tree, up on a shrub, somewhere where they're out in the open and sing their little hearts out. So um, keep your ears open. You might hear those the song sparrow start to sing. And here's some good photos of them. They've got more stripes on them than your um, house sparrow would, and they tend to have a little uh, dot. The stripes tend to kind of formulate down to a little dot on their breast. So this is a song sparrow. So they are definitely coming back into the area. Sometimes you can see them in the winter, but they tend to uh, be further south during the winter months. And now there's definitely more of them in the area right now. Another photo sent in by Mark. Uh, it says, the chase is on. Crows chasing the red-tailed hawk. This was at Erie Canal Lock 32. You can see the crows going after the red-tailed hawk there. And here's the red-tailed hawk flying out of the frame, uh, being chased away by the crows. This mobbing behavior is typical with crows and birds of prey. If you hear crows going bonkers, um, they're probably going after a hawk or an owl. That's a good way to tell you have an owl in the area is the crows are going after it. They don't want the, they don't want those birds anywhere near where they are nesting. So that's pretty typical. They try to scare them away. 
So really neat photos there. And then Great Blue Heron. So Great Blue Heron back in the area. And here's a picture Mark sent in from Kings Bend Park of a Great Blue Heron. And we've talked about waterfowl migration. So the peak of waterfowl migration is over for our area, but that doesn't mean that there aren't neat ducks to be seen around here, like this wood duck that um, Mark sent in from a Tinker Nature Park. So um, there's some ducks that are just kind of migratory that just fly through the area and we, we, we see them sporadically, but then there's some that we'll have here all summer long and the wood duck is one of those. Wood duck is another cavity nester when we're talking about um, the place, different places that birds are nesting. They'll nest in hollow trees. They will nest in nest boxes if you happen to have the right habitat. So this is a male wood duck here back in, back in town, which is exciting. And Phoebes. So um, the Phoebes are a type of fly catcher and they're uh, their call sounds like they're saying Phoebe. So I can actually pull up their call because this is something that you can typically hear if you're going out anywhere, anywhere birding this time of the year, you can usually hear the Phoebe calling. So I'll pull up my Merlin app here and play the song of the Phoebe. So it sounds like they're saying Phoebe. So that is the Eastern Phoebe and they are back in the area. So that was a, another photo sent in by Mark there of the Phoebe at Tinker Nature Park, which is a great place to go birding this time of the year. It's a great place to go birding most times of the year, uh, but there's a really good diversity of birds there. The trail isn't super long. It's very level. So um, Tinker Nature Park is a fabulous place to go birding this time of the year. And there was also a purple finch spotted there. So here is a purple finch. You might get house finches at your feeders. Sometimes purple finches will come to feeders as well. Um, they are going to be more of a raspberry color, kind of a deeper red, deeper purple than your house finch. So here is a purple finch. And Cheryl also had purple finch at her feeder. Um, it can sometimes be hard to tell the difference between the house finch and the purple finch. But if you look at the purple finch, they don't have a lot of striping on their breast like a house finch would. And if you look at their wings, they have purple stripes on the wings too, whereas the house finch tends to have white stripes. So here's a picture of the male and female purple finch that Cheryl got at her feeders. And for comparison, here's a house finch. So they look kind of similar. They can be hard to tell the difference. But if you look at the house finch here, it's got more stripes on it and the, the wings aren't going to have purple on it at all. So they've got white stripes here on their wings, whereas the purple finch has a lot of purple there on its wings. Just some ways you can kind of tell them apart. Purple finches are bigger, they have larger bills, but that can also be hard to tell if you only have one or the other at your feeder and you don't have them both at the same time. So some purple finch seen in the area, which is really neat. Here's another song, Sparrow. This shows the striped swell and that little black uh, dot there on their breast. This is from Tinker Nature Park. They've got lots of song sparrows there. We were there doing a binocular class on Thursday and there's some song sparrows singing. And then here's a Northern Flicker. So this is a bird you might see at your feeders. A lot of people were getting them at their feeders this winter when the, the weather was harsh, there wasn't that much natural food for them to find. They were coming to feeders pretty often. So this is your Northern Flicker, which is a type of woodpecker, another cavity nesting bird. You can get bird houses for them um, as well if you're trying to attract woodpeckers. And they'll also excavate their own cavities out of trees. And then this is a great photo of the Flicker because it shows the yellow underneath its wings. When they're flying, you can see those the yellow. So if you see a woodpecker or some kind of bird that's flying and you can see yellow underneath the wings, it's probably going to be a flicker. So um, another type of woodpecker, red-bellied woodpecker, another bird you might see at your feeders as well. They love suet and um, they will also uh, nest in cavities. So you can get them coming to your yard in a couple different ways, both with the suet feeders and with uh, a nest box that's large enough for the woodpeckers. And then of course the pileated woodpecker. Everybody loves the pileated woodpecker. 
And here you can see the pileated woodpecker is making quick work of this tree. And they will peck holes in trees that are rectangular. And you can see that starting to happen here. So if you see large rectangular holes in a tree, that's going to be from your pileated woodpecker. And some other neat sightings here. Here is a kingfisher. So kingfisher you can find by the water, like their name suggests they do eat little fish. Um, so they tend to perch kind of like this on a branch that's overhanging some kind of a water, uh, some kind of water, whether it be a stream or a lake. And sometimes they'll hover also. Um, so you see a bird that's just kind of hovering over the water. It's probably a kingfisher. They kind of hover and then they'll dive down into the water to get their uh, their little fish there. And here's another picture of a kingfisher. And this was taken at um, on Lake Ontario, the, the Arundacoit Bay Pier. So Delta Kingfisher, look for them by the water. They're definitely around. And uh, Mark also sent in some photo of red-breasted merganser. So here's a red-breasted merganser that's out by Lake Ontario and the Arundaquite Bay Pier. So some different waterfowl that's out there right now. And Paul sent in this great photo here of a short-eared owl hunting. He said, in light of your owl presentation Tuesday, I thought I'd share a shorty on the hunt from Saturday. This is from uh, last Saturday in Livingston County. So short eared owls. If you guys watched um, Dana Ford, who was with us on Tuesday, she gave a great presentation about owls of New York and short eared owl were one of those. They're an endangered species that we have here in the state and in the area. They're going to be here during the winter months and um, there's still some hanging around. They like open fields. So that's where you can find them hunting at dusk. Um, large open field. So if you have a large open field that you're getting bluebirds in, check it out at dusk. You never know, you might see a short-eared owl hunting. You might hear that American woodcock singing and doing its crazy spiral um, mating ritual. So really good time of the year to check out any kind of open fields and grasslands for some different types of birds and activity. And then here's another pileated woodpecker. This was sent in by Lee. She said, someone sure likes your woodpecker favorite. So here's the pileated woodpecker. It looks like almost like a little too big for the feeder there, um, going after some nuts there in the woodpecker blend. And finally, thought I'd share with you this photo sent in by Anne Marie. She's had this bird in her backyard in January. This is when the, these photos were, were from. Um, she sent this in. Uh, that she's had this bird visiting her a couple of times here. This is a leucistic cardinal. So there's sometimes different color morphs of birds. Um, you've probably heard of albino animals. They tend to be, they're, they're going to be all white with red eyes. They're lacking all pigments. But if a bird or an animal is just lacking some pigments, it's called being leucistic or having leucism. And here's a perfect example of that. This is a cardinal that is leucistic. So it's mostly white, but it still has some red pigments in it. And she had this in her backyard this winter. So she just sent those photos in. Really cool sighting, not something you normally see. Um, they to get hunted, you know, by um, by other birds because they, they stand out so much. So they tend not to be around too long. Um, but that being said, we had a customer who had a leucistic titmouse, tufted titmouse in their yard for about three years. So you never know. So this is a really cool photo of a leucistic cardinal sent in by Anne Marie from right here in Rochester. So um, really, really neat sighting there. And here's a good photo of it too. You can see just how white it is. So it's lacking, uh, just lacking some pigments there. So uh, thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions or sightings, absolutely put those in the comments. And I should mention too, on Tuesday, we'll have Dana Ford back. She's going to talk about hawk migration. Right now is a really awesome time to go see the hawk migration over Braddock's Bay. So they've got this big hawk watching platform. Their hawk watcher, David Brown, is there every day counting the number of uh, birds that fly overhead. They had a really big day with a whole bunch of turkey vultures flying over the other day. And um, you never know 
what kind of migration day you might have over there. So if you're looking for a good bird watching experience, heading out to Braddock Bay Park right now is fantastic. You'll uh, on a nice day, it'll be full of bird watchers so you can be amongst your people. Um, so let's see who's on. Cindy says, good morning to you all. Good morning, uh, Cindy. Bob, who sent in the photos of the bluebirds nesting and who had that brown creeper photo, he says, good morning. Bluebirds still building the nest in the nest box. The male is being very good about keeping squirrels, chipmunks, house sparrows, and starlings away. Also notice a dark, possibly black butterfly flying around. Aha, yes. So that is probably a morning cloak butterfly. So morning cloak butterflies, um, they will hibernate as adults. So usually we think of... Um, of butterflies um, only being around in the summer, but even in the winter, sometimes you can see morning cloak butterflies if there's a warm winter day. A lot of butterflies will spend the winter in their uh, cocoon, you know, in their, their pupa, in that kind of stage. Sometimes they'll spend the winter as an egg. It can be a different form, you know, different life stages depending on the species, but morning cloaks are one that will overwinter as an adult. So they will wedge themselves in, in tree crevices or under bark. If you've ever seen a butterfly house, that's to attract um, butterflies that overwinter as an, as an adult. So but butterfly houses aren't like a birdhouse where they're going to go in there and lay their eggs and that kind of thing. Butterfly houses are made for them to wedge themselves into over the winter. And the morning cloak butterfly is one of those. So they'll spend all winter as an adult and so you'll see them in the early spring start to come out once the weather warms up. So it's probably what you saw. So that's really cool. We'll have to share some photos of morning cloak um, butterflies coming up so we can show you guys what they look like. But um, that's a really neat sighting too. Um, Karen says, good morning. Cindy says, why does the American woodcock have such a short tail? So let's see if I can pull back the American woodcock here. They do have a very short tail. Um, shorebirds in general just tend to have short tails. Um, I'm not sure if there's really a reason why they have such a short tail, but they have a very long bill and yeah, a, a very, very short tail. So here's another photo of it as well. Yeah, they do have a very short stubby tail there. Um, Margaret says, good morning. Had a couple, had fun a couple of days ago watching a male red-breasted woodpecker uh, pursuing his lady up and down the tree, yakking it up. Okay, so Margaret saw some breeding behavior there of a red-bellied woodpecker. Uh, yeah, you can see them kind of going up and down the trees. They'll spread their wings out, and that's a little mating ritual that they have. Um, Cindy says, thank you for showing us how to use the eBird switch to New York Portal. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, so if you use eBird, you can absolutely switch to the New York Breeding Bird Atlas if you're in New York. And you can help um, that atlas by reporting any kind of breeding bird behavior you see while out hiking or even in just in your backyard. Every sighting is important. Rich says, good morning. A bluebird came to visit our suet feeder this morning. Tried to get a picture, but the battery in our camera was dead. That sounds like something that would happen to me. <laughs> you get a good photo op and then the camera dies. So sounds like they had some uh, bluebirds here coming to their feeders. So we do hear of bluebirds coming to feeders every once in a while, especially if you have mealworms out. That's the best way to attract the bluebirds to your backyard. So mealworms are great. Any kind of suet if it has berries in it, they like. And then we also have suet cakes that have mealworms in them. So they like those as well. If we talk about the bugs, nuts, and fruit blend that we carry here, both in suet cake form and in, and in logs. Th those have been super popular with bluebirds. Uh, let's see here. I ship says good morning from PA. Good morning from to to you in Pennsylvania. Cindy says great pictures of the bluebirds dancing. Love the blue house for the bluebird. Yes, yeah, that blue house is cute. Here's a picture of the female doing her flashy dance that Bob sent in. So really cool. And uh, I ship says just removed a house sparrow nest from my bluebird house. That is a very common thing to have to do this time of the year. Um, birds will compete for nesting spaces. It can be, uh, real estate can be hard to find for the birds. One thing you can do to alleviate some of that competition, if you're, if the house sparrow is consistently getting into the house is putting up another house, you know, anywhere from five to 15 feet ne next to it. Sometimes the house sparrow will go in one and then leave the other house alone for the bluebirds or 
you know, tree swallows, whatever you're getting, they'll sometimes leave them alone. That's one thing you can do. Um, Karen, who had the awesome photo of the pheasant from her backyard, which I think, what, here it is. She says, good morning. The goldfinches are turning quite yellow. Our unexpected pheasant visitor has been here every day this week. We seem to be on his daily route. Oh, that's so cool. So it wasn't just a one-time thing. The pheasant has found probably some good scraps underneath the feeder and is, uh, is a returning visitor. That's really neat. Um, Sandy says, saw a red-winged blackbird last weekend. So Sandy is seeing some of these early spring migrants uh, coming into town. Uh, let's see. Heavy Cream says, just saw a red-winged blackbird for the first time this year today. So lots of people are starting to see the and Catherine says, I had a male red-winged blackbird at my feeder in Penfield this week. So they are coming to feeders as well as starting to filter into the marshes and wetlands there to begin their breeding season. Barb says, I can't keep the hornets out of the jelly. There's so many around it that the Orioles can't get to it. So that is an issue that people tend to have, especially as we get later in the season. Right now, like this time of the year, um, when the Orioles first start to come in, they, um, the bees and wasps aren't so bad right now, but as we get on later in the season, the hives grow and there's more individuals there that will absolutely come to the jelly. It can be really hard to keep them away, um, but there's a few things you can do. We have um, fake wasp nests that you can put out and those have been helpful for people. They mimic a bald-faced hornet's nest. If you've ever seen those big gray uh, hornet's nests, it looks like that. And bald-faced hornets are quite nasty. And if you put one of these decoys up, it can help keep the bees and wasps away. They don't wanna be anywhere near those bald-faced hornets and I don't blame them. So if you hang that up around your Oriole feeder, that can help scare um, hornets and bees and wasps away from your Oriole feeder. Another thing people do is if you put together a really sugary solution, so something like your, your hummingbird nectar where it's one part sugar to four parts water, if you do something like that, but even more with more sugar um, and put it kind of away from your feeders. Sometimes the bees and wasps and hornets will go to that instead of your feeders. So it's kind of like a decoy, um, you know, putting putting the food somewhere else where they can feed from it, uh, but they won't bother the feeders as often. So that's something else you can do to try to keep them away. I know they can get they can get bad as soon as uh, as soon as we get later into the season. There's ways to easily keep ants out of the, the feeders, but not so much the bees, wasps, and hornets. They can be difficult. Some Oriole feeders have wasp guards and bee guards on them, but anything you, with jelly, there's no way to keep them out, unfortunately. Um, Cindy says, I was astounded to see the courage of a male red-winged blackbird last year going after a red-tailed hawk that had most likely a female red-winged blackbird under its talons. Oh my gosh, I think the female did eventually get free. Yeah, so uh, we have the, the photo here of the uh, red-tailed hawk getting mobbed by the crows and uh, red-winged blackbirds will go after them as well. It sounds like um, Cindy saw a, a red-tailed hawk that had gone after a female and the, the male was going after it. So really interesting behavior there. Yeah, they are quite, they are quite bold. And Sandy says, thanks to the suggestion from the staff at your store, putting out strictly safflower has made a huge difference in my yard. The feeders stay filled so much longer since the squirrel doesn't like it. Yes. So when we're talking about the uh, the blackbirds, like the grackles if, and, and the types of seed they don't like, safflower seed is what we always recommend to keep them away. And the squirrels really don't like it either. So I'm glad that's working for you, Sandy. That's, that's good news to hear. Um, Randy says three pairs of goldfinch yesterday and a pair of cowbirds, cardinals and blue jays all week. So Randy's getting a good diversity of birds there in his yard. And Ed says earlier this week saw a male bluebird 
feeding a female with something from the feeders. Is that considered nesting behavior? Um, yeah, that would be considered um, a breeding behavior when they are giving, uh, sometimes it's called giving them a nuptial gift or there's different terms for it. But yeah, um, it's called aloe feeding, I think is another term for it, where the male is feeding the female. It's, um, that is a breeding, a breeding behavior. Cardinals do that. So you might see that um, happening in your backyard with cardinals. They're known to do that um, pretty often. So yeah, that's absolutely a sign of breeding behavior there. Um, Randy says, bluebirds, male and female look alike. What's the difference? Very good question. The males are going to be a darker blue. So the females are more kind of like a powder blue and the males are going to be much darker. So here's a picture of the female here. She's kind of like a powdery blue. And then the male is going to be dark blue like this. So here's, this is the male here, very, very dark blue. And the female, more of a powder blue. So you can tell the difference between male and female uh, with the bluebirds. The females are just that much lighter in color. Um, Randy also says, oh, had a house finch here too. So a bunch of different birds there. Um, Bella says, I feel your pain. I had to block the entrance to my bluebird box since a male house sparrow had become attached to it. I didn't want... I have a pair of bluebirds in another box. So battles with house finches are quite common uh, this time of the year. Once your bluebirds are established in a box, there's ways to scare the sparrows with uh, a sparrow spooker of holographic tape that drapes over the house. Um, that can help scare them away once the bluebirds laid an egg. You can put those up on your house. So there's different things you can do to keep house sparrows away once um, you've got the bluebirds nesting, once they've laid an egg. But before that, it can be kind of a battle for them. Um, Cindy says, thanks, Paul, for the great picture of the short-eared owl. Yes, Paul sent in an awesome photo of a short-eared owl hunting over uh, grassland or some kind of a meadow there. I can pull it up. Here it is. Oh, yeah, really cool photo there. It's like got its eyes on the prize there. It's looking for something uh, to, to eat. Uh, Randy says, when should I put out the Oriole feeder? Last week of April. So that's when they start to come in. So um, anytime before that, you, it doesn't hurt to put it out earlier, but really um, every year they come back around the same time last week of April. Um, Cindy says, thank you, Liz and everyone sending in the pictures. Have a great Saturday. Yes, everybody. Um, uh, let's see, Bella says, do the, the slotted bluebird houses really deter house sparrows? Yes and no. So it's not a hundred percent the the boxes that have that rectangular opening that kind of looks like this instead of the circle it's just not what the house sparrows prefer so it's uh it's not 100 percent like anything in life i suppose but it does help so the slotted boxes tend to have a shallow more of a shallow nesting cavity as well and house sparrows prefer a nesting cavity that is deeper and they like that circular entrance hole so that is their preference to have a deeper nesting cavity one with a circular entrance but bluebirds aren't as picky so it's it's not 100 percent, but it can help so um, Kathy also said, what is the timing on the Orioles arrival last, yep, last weekend of April. So it'll be here. It'll be here, uh, fairly soon, not soon enough, but it'll be here soon. Um, Ed says, I caught a glimpse of a dark, but, um, butterfly this week as well. Not enough of a sighting to ID, but guessing it was a morning cloak. Yes, it probably was a morning cloak butterfly. Um, we do have different types of butterflies that are dark in color, but this time of the year, it's probably going to be a morning cloak because they are, um, they, they are out this time of the year and Bella says those fake hornets nests do help. So it sounds like Bella has used those to keep the, uh, to keep the hornets and, uh, bees and wasps away from the Oriole feeder and has had some luck with it. Uh, Lois says waiting for tree swallows to arrive. Yeah. So if you have bluebird houses out, um, you might, if you've got an, a wide open field, you might just get tree swallows, uh, nesting in them as well. So they like that same kind of wide open habitat. Um, let's see. Karen says we have flocks of male red wings, but haven't seen any females. Where are they? Um, sometimes the males will, will migrate in first followed by the females. So it could be that they're just lagging behind, um, and you just haven't seen them yet. So I'd keep it, keep an eye out. You might see them coming just later after the males. Sometimes the males will migrate in before the females. So it could just be that they are, they are, uh, they're on their way, but just haven't arrived yet 
to the feeders. So it looks like that's everybody's comments and questions. Thank you guys for tuning in. We'll be back on Tuesday with uh, with Dana Ford from Braddock Bay talking about hawk migration. We get lots of questions this time of year about uh, bird identification. I can't recommend this book enough, the Birds of New York book, especially if you're getting, if you're just getting into birding. It's awesome because everything's arranged by color. So if you see a bird with green on it, you just go to the tab that is green and you can find your bird that way. So Highly recommend this book. If you don't have it yet, it's like a must have for everybody's birding library. And then of course, there's always that Merlin app that you'll hear me talking about at nauseum as we get into the, the nesting and breeding season and migration season. Um, and that's absolutely free that you can download on your phone. So thank you guys for tuning in. We'll be back on Tuesday and I hope you have a great weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.